so my role is effectively to bring in wonderful people who are willing to open their homes to be foster carers and I'm always really privileged <laughs> to do these events with Lynn um you'll either see me crying or laughing but as, as you know she tells us some of our stories um she has some wonderful stories so I'll hand over to Lynn for her to introduce herself Good evening. I was going to say it's lovely to see you. I can't actually see you because you're because you're blank screen, but I know you're, you're there. Um, my name's Lynn Blenko, and together with my husband, we've fostered for 44 years, and we've looked after 93 children altogether. We currently have two of the most wonderful young people. We have a, a, a little boy who's 11, who's been with us seven years, and my wonderful, wonderful 20-year-old who's with us under a scheme called Staying Put. So when young people reach 18, if it's right for the young person and it's right for the foster care, then they can stay with you until at least 21, sometimes 25. The most wonderful, wonderful young people. I'm here to answer any question you like about fostering. Laura, head of recruitment, so she's going to tell you, you know, all, all the wonderful things about Capstone, but I'm going to tell you what it's really, really like. And I promise you that any question you ask is absolutely fine. And I will give the honest answer on what it's like to foster for Capstone. Mm. No question is a silly question. You know, absolutely not. We may not. And we'd able... love it if you wanted to talk to us. We'd absolutely. love it if, if, you, love if it. you felt able to have a chat. And I just want to say there, there is no pressure there is no hard sell you can't persuade somebody to be a foster carer it's got to be the right time or the right thing for you so mm. please don't worry that we're going to be you know like getting you to sign on the dotted line it's <laughs> not like that at all this is this is just an information session for you because it might be right for you or it might be right for somebody that you know yes absolutely we're, we're always advocates of word of mouth so if this mm. is something that you think of somebody else that you can share the information with mm. we'd be grateful for that as well because there's such a need so mm. just to introduce a little bit why we're here um our relationship with restless we've been working with ad quite a bit to get this going um over 50s are actually our target audience i'll go on a little bit more about why it's such a perfect <coughs> audience for us um and obviously Restless, that is that all the members of Restless are over 50. So we thought, well, this would be a really good opportunity for us to raise awareness of fostering and talk to people about fostering. And again, even if it's not for you now, or even if it's for somebody else that you think about, you think you know, then that's a good job done as far as we're concerned. So one of the things we've done recently with Restless, and you might have been involved in this, is that we did a survey because we're always interested in actually how many people really understand what fostering is because you can foster and you can adopt. Um, and then how many people are interested or may have thought about it. And it was really interesting and kind of um, comforting to know that in our survey, 94% um, pe of people knew what it means to foster a child. So that for us is good. That means people are aware um, and that, you know, people will, if it's right for them, be coming to us. Um, about half of people had thought about fostering before. However, it was a much smaller number who would ever actually think about going for it. And this is typical, actually. It's such a big thing to do, as Lynn mentioned, that people have thought about it and people would love to open their homes, but actually come getting down to the, you know, actually doing it and making it fit within your lifestyle is a lot of consideration and that's why as Lynn said none of this is a hard sell it's about and it's purely information and conversation 12 percent of the people that we spoke to which is actually pretty good mm. wanted to learn more about <clears throat> fostering so we're kind of in dialogue with people now about that so we're really pleased about that um why are we even doing this um it's because there's a crisis in foster care. We were chatting about this with Aideen earlier on when we were talking about this this evening. Um, it is predicted. We have a national body called the Fostering Network who kind of works across the, the, the country and kind of lobbies to government and keeps track of the sector. And it was it is predicted that there's going to be 100,000 children in care by 2025 and about a shortage of 25,000 carers. So that's huge. And there's various reasons for that. Um, probably the most immediate reasons for us are the pandemic changed a lot. A lot of people now work at home, so they don't have a spare room. Um, 
a lot of people have spent two years not been able to see their own family and have thought, actually, I'm going to spend a bit of time on my own family, even though I thought fostering was for me, I've put it off. Um, and a lot of people just just aren't right there. People might have younger children. People might just be, still be living their lives and running their careers and not quite ready to do fostering yet. So there's a multitude of reasons why there is this shortage, but it has most definitely been exacerbated by the pandemic. So it's a bit of a perfect storm. Most recently, we've got um, cost of living and so on. That's having more impact on vulnerable families which in simple terms, chances are more children are going to come into care and that number's going to rise. So this is why we're so passionate about talking to people like yourselves and so grateful that you've come on because there is genuinely a crisis in foster care and we're trying to do all we can to speak to as many people as possible who would be interested in becoming foster carers. So why, why are we here? I mentioned before, over 50s, it's perfect. Our average age of a foster carer is actually 56. Um, we have personally met many foster carers who are, are, I can give an example where in recent months we had an inquiry from a single lady. She was, pardon me, she was 72. Um, but the energy and the drive and the passion, <clears throat> and the motivation that she had to become a foster carer was just excellent. Her experience, she's got life experience, she's been through an awful lot, and it counts for so, so much. Um, on paper, you might have thought, well, 72, really, with a child, but actually, you know, you can foster teenagers. There's a huge need for fostering teenagers. You don't necessarily have to be running around after a two-year-old. Um, so this foster carer, who is now a fully fledged foster carer, went through the process and is now a fully fledged foster carer with her first child in placement. So that's just so heartwarming to see that somebody who was actually a little bit nervous about picking up the phone because they thought she thought she may have been too old. Absolutely not. There's absolutely life. Life in a year. I've just noticed somebody else has entered the waiting room. Shall I admit them? You can do that. Yeah. And, and you say you say 72. The older you get, and I'm 62 and my husband's 69, the older you get, 72 is absolutely no age. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely no age at all. And quite rightly, there is no upper age limit for fostering. No, no upper age limit at all. And, and many of us, unfortunately, I'm not lucky enough to be a grandmother yet. Uh, I'm, I'm always, always living in hope of that. I'd tell my two birth sons. But... If, if, if you were a grandparent of our age, you wouldn't think twice about looking after your grandchildren of a similar age. And, it, and it's exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. We've got the energy. We've got the enthusiasm. We most definitely have got life experience and transferable skills. Mm, absolutely. Um, and Lynn, we've talked before about the lifestyle it affords as well. It's not a nine to five job. You know, you're web, you're based at home. You you do have to be available for things like school runs, which we can talk about a little bit later. But you know, mm -hmm. once a, once a child is settled with you and you're in a routine, it actually gives you quite a flexible lifestyle to be able to work around as well. It's not you're not pinned to a desk. Um, exactly. On, on, a, there was on a, a screen all day. <laughs> there, was a, there was a lovely. I'm on a Facebook page for foster carers, and there was a lovely uh, message today from a foster carer saying that she took a little one to school. And her and her husband went off to see the, the premiere of Top Gun. She said, there oh. am I sitting 10 o'clock in the morning at my, at my senior cinema with my cup of tea and my free Kit Kat, thinking this is very nice, thank you very much. Um, so you can do all of those things. So by the time that ch my child, I have all day to myself to, to go out for lunch, to do my shopping and all sorts of bits and pieces. And then when my child comes home, I, I love to be the equivalent of a butlin's red coat. I always wanted to be a Butlin's red coat when I grew up. I, I actually was in the police for 22 years, but I wanted to be a Butlin's red coat. And I love that playing with the child, reading books with him, doing jigsaws with him, playing Lego with him. Absolutely love that. And then eight o'clock he goes to bed and then we have our evenings to ourselves. Absolutely. Um, some of the, we were chatting about this when we were developing this presentation and we were saying, really important things that so you you know hopefully people have got a support an established support network around them but not only that we have a superb support network I mean Lynn can tell you a typical scenario about when she's needed some support mm -hmm. from Capstone is that okay Lynn? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I've, I've got my two lovely birth sons. One of them lives in Bangkok and the other one lives next door in a converted, uh, a converted little house. And they're my backup carers. So when I go to see my son in Bangkok, my son that lives next door moves into the house with his partner and they look after the children for me. Works absolutely beautifully. Um, other times it could be maybe, uh, 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 it could have been a bereavement and a family funeral and it's not, it's not appropriate for the children that we look after to go. Um, and if I don't have anybody in my immediate network, I can say to Capstan, have you got anybody that can just help me out here? Um, I've also helped out another foster carer she lives up the road and she's yeah similar age to me um, she's probably slightly older and she loves looking after babies and she had two babies and so I went to look after these two babies I don't know how she did that talk about juggling and there they both were and uh, so I looked after her babies while she went to a family wedding so th the support is out there and, and one of the main things about Capstan is the general support that you have so uh, at least once a month, you have something called supervision. And just this afternoon, our supervising social worker has been here and she talks about how things are going. You know, she helps us choose what training would be appropriate, talks about what holidays, are we looking after ourselves? What are we doing for ourselves? So the support from Capstone is excellent. And that's 24 seven, 365 days of the year. There is always somebody, sorry, always somebody that you can pick the phone up to even if you just want to check I'm thinking that this is this the right thing and they can give you advice so you're never ever on your own mm. and I think something you said there Lynn you've said to me before about you know it's very important that you look after yourself you're giving so much to these children and young people but actually yeah. you still you are still you you are still Lynn you still go to your choir once a week and you still yeah. go out for dinner with your friends and you still, you know, whilst you're committed to the children in your care, you still absolutely look after yourself and do your own thing because there is there is capacity to do so. That's really, really important. So I've just come back from a week in Sweden. Uh, I sing in a, a barbershop choir. So we went over for the European competition and it was absolutely brilliant. And my husband held the fort here with some support and then within about three weeks time he, he does some um, steam railways he builds narrow gauge steam railways so off he goes to do his thing so the, the child fits in with your lifestyle you know you don't have to change everything because you've got this child coming in because that that's not realistic you know the child fits in with you and you support the child and just like you would with with any family member absolutely okay moving on the next point on our slide this is why we need the slides to make sure that we keep focus um your pension, if you are fortunate enough to have a pension over 50 or even older, as we said, any age is appropriate. Mm. Um, it, when you get paid to foster, you get paid when a child is in placement with you. So you're not getting paid a salary, you're getting paid an allowance that's, that's only received by yourself when you've got that child in placement. Now, because that's an allowance, it doesn't affect your pension. Um, there's a we'll talk a bit later on about the bit more detail about finance but the allowance you do get is subject to tax relief as well so we do see that older people find it actually you know let, let's you know the, your primary reason for being a foster carer is because you want to give back and you want to do something for children and young people but actually I think the quote I've heard lately is I don't do it for the money but I couldn't do it without the money because we all have bills to pay. We all have roofs over our heads to make sure that we maintain. Um, so mm. that's a consideration for people to just think about the fact that it's not a salary and it wouldn't affect any pensions and there is quite mm. a significant tax relief. And then finally, and I think we've made this point, um, we welcome people who are single, in relationships, in same-sex relationships, in people from all walks of life. Nobody's judging anything it's all about the capacity of you as a household a single household a busy household to be able to look after these children and that's based upon your experience and all the other things we'll discuss now I know people are on mute but I just wanted to check has anybody got any questions at this point you're more I know somebody's joined us since we started you're more than welcome to put your hand up to shout out a question we're very friendly no question is a silly question um, so just feel free, if you wish, to just, oh, Marjorie's raised her hand. Hi, Hi Marjorie. Yeah. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good uh, so, you. 
I am good. I have a, I have a question about um, in relation to backup carers. Mm. So um, I I'm actually it was really interesting to hear the but I was wondering so if you have personal backup. Era, um, do they have to actually go through some sort of vetting process or do they have to actually be qualified or anything like that? Or can you, for example, could you have a friend <clears throat> babysit for you? How does that work? So with your, with your backup carer, yeah, they, they would have to have a, a, a risk assessment. And that's, that's only a very basic chat. What, you know, do they know who to contact in an emergency? Um, and they would have, if it was a regular babysitter, then they would have a, a DBS check, a disclosure buying service check, just to make sure that they're the right, the right sort of person. But they don't have to be qualified as a foster care. They don't have to go through the whole process. It would just be an interview and uh, say a, a DBS check. And you can have as many of those as you like. So I've got, I've got several backup carers that I use because yeah, my husband and I like to go out and we like to go away for the weekend and, mm -hmm. and all of that. And, my children, and because they're regular friends and relatives, actually, my, my great niece, uh, she's a primary school teacher. She's just uh, going to become one of our backup carers. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, not a, it's not an onerous task for them. Okay, fantastic, thank you. That's okay, thank you for asking us questions. Yeah, that was lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Nothing at this stage. And honestly, even if we're in a flow of question of, of talking, yeah. there's only there's only a few of us. If you suddenly just think of what they are, you know, what did that mean, or what, let, you know, something just springs to mind, you don't feel you have to wait till the end. Just pop your hand up. We're we're you know more than welcome to have a dialogue. Oh, Marjorie's here again. Fabulous. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I do no, have another. No, don't apologise. <laughs> so I'm I'm just wondering, do you have to commit to having a child come and live with you on an ongoing basis, or do you have requirements for temporary placements? So, for example, you know, eight weeks at a time, or while they're in transition, or anything like that. Marjorie, I think we missed the beginning of the question because when you start speaking, it goes a little bit robotic, but then we kind of hear the think, end. So I think, I think the question is about respite yeah. care, Laura. I think it's about was, respite care. Was it about short, short term, different lengths of placements, Marjorie? Yes, yes. So we, we have a variety of placements. So we receive our referrals from a local authority. So when the local, the local authority works very closely with organisations like us, um, and when they need a, a home for a child in a foster home, they come out to us and they give us the profile of the child. They give us all the information about the child's background, why they're in care, <clears throat> what's going on for that child at the moment, um, why they may be moving placement or whether it's their first placement. It, we, as much information as they need. And as part of that information, it will tell us what type of placement they're looking for for this child. So we'd have emergency placements where we get a call at six o'clock on a Friday, who, um, where they may say, this young boy has only just come into care. You know, the police have been involved and we've just found this young lad. Um, he needs to be in care and we don't really know much about him, um, but we need to hold him for the weekend and we need to do our investigations to see what's going on and what might be the right steps for him. So that could be something that literally lasts a few days. Um, we have short term placements, which again range from anything from a few weeks up to a few months or even you know, up to a couple of years. And that could be any reason, you know, think the reasons children come into care. It could be that, you know, it could be something as, um, as simple as a child lives with a single parent. That single parent is having to go into hospital, but that single parent has no support work, what, support network whatsoever. Um, and is very isolated and actually somebody needs to look after this child so it could be something as straightforward as that where it's a short term I think you, you like almost a holding placement I think is one of the, the type of description you gave or it could be that we know that there's a plan for the child we know that there's that the child potentially is going into longer term foster care anyway but actually there's a few weeks where that child needs looking after prior to going into their kind of permanent or longer term placement 
Um, Lynn, you mentioned respite. We do have carers who provide respite for other foster carers. So as part of that support network that Lynn talked about and the flexibility, you get um, a number of days, 14 days respite a year. Um, and that's paid effectively like holiday, but we don't call it holiday because you're not really being paid a salary as such. But it's effectively 14 days where you will still get paid and you will not have to look after that child um, or children. And some foster carers say, no, actually, I'd rather be paid for that and I'd rather have the children with me all the time. But other foster carers are well within their rights to say, no, myself, and my husband or myself, and my friend or whatever it is you do, we want our two weeks a year off on our own. <laughs> Lynn's advocating for that one. <laughs> um, definitely, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and, and therefore there's a network of respite foster carers who are people who have been properly assessed. And um, so it wouldn't be your direct support network. They could be part of it. But actually, if you need a formal respite carer to come in and look after that child for a period of time, because you're not going to be, we do have that option as well. That's sometimes weekends, it's sometimes the odd week. Respite carers get very, very busy in the summer <laughs> um, because they're kind of covering other carers' holidays and so on, or, or their respite. Um, and then in terms of the length of other foster care placements, we do have long-term fostering. I, the way I describe it, and Lynn can correct me if there's a better way of describing it, but every child in care has a plan behind them. There's a care plan. It's in nobody's interest for this child not to have a plan behind them and the ultimate aim for all children is to have what we call permanence so a permanent solution to where their home is now that could be going home it could be that the family's rehabilitated or the, the issues and challenges that the family have had a resolved. so it's appropriate for the child to go home it could be that especially for younger children sadly less so for older children it could be that the plan is that that child's going to get adopted but they're in care while the adoption proceedings are happening or it could be that especially for older children we know this child's not going to go home we know adoption's not right for them but actually long-term fostering is right we don't want any kids jumping around the system and having to go from foster home to foster home mm -hmm. Like any of us, and like we'd want for our own children or ourselves, we want stability. The key thing is stability and permanence for these children, young people. So long-term fostering is something where you could have a child join you. At, I'll make it up eight or nine. They're not going to be adopted for whatever reasons. There could be things around, you know, legislative things around the relationship with the family or anything going on, but they're not going to be adopted. They can't go home. So we look for long-term fostering and we look for a family that will be able to look after that child up until 18 and beyond. Lynn can probably um, de develop that, that conversation a little bit more from her experience. Um, other types of fostering, we have parent and child fostering. We were actually chatting about this before and it's, um, it's lesser known actually, but we really do need parent and child foster carers. So effectively, um, and I'll just put this in very simple terms, parent and child fostering is where stereotypically, but it could be a different makeup, um, a mum and a baby need support. The mum needs support in learning how to parent or in being a better parent, working with boundaries, working with routines, not going off with the boyfriend that she might have who's a bad influence, learning how to be a mum. So in very, very simplistic terms, I see parent and child as almost a bit of a, a, a grandparent figure in that relationship. So this mm. person clearly hasn't got their... Or the, it's not appropriate for whatever reason for their own parents to support them in their parenting. But you, a, a, a young person with a child will go into a fostering setting with foster carers who will almost guide, support, teach parenting skills. Now, quite often in those scenarios, um, it's, again, it's the way I describe it, very kind of very kind of straightforward language, but it's almost the last opportunity to see if this parent is going to be okay to look after this child or whether this child should be put into care or put in um, for adoption ultimately. Um, and Lynn was saying earlier that often, it, it, it sadly is that the the mum, if it is a mum, may, may end up going back to a partner who might be unsuitable. Mm. It is a sad thing, but generally that type of placement is court led. Generally, there's a quite a bit of an assessment going on as well. So because that decision, if the child isn't going to stay with the mum or the father, because it is dads as well, um, then 
the foster care is very involved in writing reports, observing, as well as the teaching and guiding mm-hmm. side um, to help make that decision about that parent and that child and whether they should be together. So they're generally 12 week placements when they're assessed because you've got a specific amount of time to kind of work with that child and parents um and then you can move on to your next one so you know there's lot there's lots of different combinations of placement length and I think I've virtually covered all of them would you say Lynn have I missed anything I think so and sometimes (laughs) you get you get where a a parent let's say it's a mum and she's maybe had two three four children removed but each time she has a child, there has to be a new assessment process because this time she might just be able to do it. Something might have changed. She might have a really reliable partner now. Yeah. And, and, and that is fantastic when that happens. Mm. When, you know, you, you see she has got the parenting skills, she has got the backup from her partner and everything, you know, everything ends really well. Marjorie, you've got a question. I do. I have another one. I'm sorry. Hi. Nice. Um, so I'm just I, I, I just want to te- sense check my understanding. So when you talked about respite pl- placements, my understanding is that that would be that you would support the foster carers and, and basically go into their home to help so that they have a break. But if you were doing a short term placement, then that would be that the child would be in your home in for both, a temporary amount of in- time. In both scenarios, the child would be in your home. So even respite, oh. the child would come and stay with you. But you are okay. effectively babysitting for that child while that family are on mm. holiday, while the kind of substantive okay. foster care is on holiday or away for a couple of nights or whatever it is. Whereas the in the scenario of short-term fostering, that child is being fostered by you. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you, Claire. So, so for instance, when, when I go away, so I'm going away with my husband to the Silly Isles in a couple of weeks, we've got one of our backup carers and it works best for us when they move into the house. So my backup carer who's been approved will move into the house and everything is just the same. And if I'm lucky, she'll end up doing my ironing and cleaning my windows as well, which that would be really <laughs> good. Uh, but if, the, if uh, I didn't have a backup carer that I wanted to use, I could phone Capstan and say, do you know what, is there a respite carer available? I'd like my little one to go to a respite carer. And ideally it would be the same respite carer every time. So he knows, he doesn't think he's going to respite care. He knows he's going to see Auntie Joan and he's going to go and stay with Auntie Joan again. So he's having, a, he's having his own little holiday. And yeah. with our children, you know, we say, sometimes you go away on holiday with school. Sometimes I go away on holiday. Sometimes we all go away as a family. And, and I'm a real advocate for spending some time with your partner or your friends. I think it, you know, when when my birth children were were younger, we went away, we left the children with my mum, we left them with my sister. And for me, it's a really good opportunity to recharge your batteries because it it can be, you know, it can be quite stressful, just like life is stressful. And to have that little bit of time away, I think is really useful. Mm, Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it does. We we love the questions. Any more, any more questions? Should we, should we give you a bit more food for thought, move on, and then you can, we may have, yeah. it, may, it may raise some questions. Okay, so this is very back to basics, but we just wanted to um, let people know what foster care is in terms of our definition. So fostering is looking after a child or young person in a family setting and caring for them while their own parents are unable to do so. We've touched upon that. It could be for mental health reasons that a parent is just unable. It could be drug and alcohol issues, which often stems from mental health illness. Um, It could be families who are vulnerable themselves. They may have learning difficulties or may have been through quite a bit themselves, which just means they're not equipped to deal with being a parent. Um, Or it could be um, some of the things you may read in the press around, you know, actually there are some people out there who probably just should not be parenting. And there are things like neglect Mm. and child cruelty and so on, and children who are on a child protection um, plan and so on. Um, But we try not to judge parents because there's, you know, generally a reason around that. And as a foster carer, you often have to have some contact with parents if the child is still allowed contact Mm. with them so we very you know we try and be therapeutic in our thinking about why parents have done things they are they they have done um 
Foster care clearly provides a safe, secure, and I mentioned before, the key word is stability for children and young people. And really, when you're fostering, you're doing no different to, I mean, it's, it is, it's a different activity, but the ultimate aim is to nurture that child in the same way you'd nurture your own child to help them develop and give them the best opportunities for that child. And going back to Marjorie's question, it can be from a few hours to many years, all the way through that long term where, you know, that child is going to stay with you until they're 18 or over. Um, and fostering tends to involve the whole family. Lynn's mentioned some of her support network, uh, you know, mm. her own direct family. People have their neighbours or their, you know, if you've still got parents, they're involved. If you've still got children at home yourself, they need to be involved. Um, but again, some people are single and they have a support network who aren't family. And that's fine as well. Um, I don't want to just read off, off a slide, but this is effectively to be able to say most people can foster. There are some practical things that stop people but in terms of your situation, single people foster. We have people who are in same sex relationships. You don't have to own your own home, pets, experience with kids, not much experience with kids, but other life experience that's really mm -hmm. transferable, that's valuable. Um, people can still work, has to be flexible but we'll come on to that. Um, or people don't work, people have been retired. Absolutely all walks of life can become foster carers. And we welcome people from all walks of life because that helps us matching people with children who are coming through because not everybody suits the children who are coming through. And matching is very important to us. We can talk about that later as well. Would you add anything to that, Lynn, from your perspective? And you know, you've had networks of foster carers of friends for years and, yeah, no, if, if, if you're remotely thinking about it, then, then you know, find out a little bit more. So don't rule yourself out, rule yourself in. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, that, you know, what would be the reasons why you, you couldn't do it? Yeah. And then we could probably put those, put those to rest. Yeah, we always try and work around things and try and be as creative as possible. If we think that we can really see amazing motivation in somebody and, you know, there's, there's people have complex lives, absolutely but if there's no real reasons why we can't see that somebody should be a foster carer we would we work with you to try and overcome that yeah um moving on nicely to some of the actual criteria so the previous things were about the qualities and so on but mm. there's no upper age limit we mentioned yeah. this before um as long as you're fit and healthy um and you're ready to take on the challenge there's no upper age limit um we do do a medical as part of the assessment. We go through, we do, we do loads of checks on the assessment and that's because we have a duty of care to you to make sure that you, know, you, you are going through everything for the right reasons and so on. Um, but also we need to know that you are fit and healthy enough. So that comes later on. The one sticking point, and this is one of our biggest challenges. We have so many people inquiring every single week to be foster carers. Um, but you have to have a spare bedroom. And sadly, having a spare bedroom is increasingly rare. Um, you've got some wonderful people out there who we speak to and you just think you'd be amazing. But without a spare bedroom, we can unfortunately not take things any further. That's been exacerbated a little bit by the pandemic, as I mentioned before, to those of you who are already on the call, because people are now working at home more and so on and have turned bedrooms into studies. So people who have got a spare bedroom and have got all the qualities and um, criteria that we've talked about before, I mean, we would love conversations with you. Um, you do need to have the time and capacity to make fostering a priority. Um, the same as when you're parenting your own children, but even more so. Um, children go to school, children have appointments, children may sometimes be out of school if there's things going on for them. There may be periods of times where there could be suspensions and so on. So we need to know that people can be available. Um, children will have contact potentially with their birth parents if it's appropriate or with other family members, siblings, and so on. And that's really important that children keep that, those contacts with their birth family, it's very important. So we need carers to have that bit of extra flexibility for that. And there are meetings that come around because the child by their nature are looked after. 
um, effectively by the local authority. <laughs> um, meetings have to happen. We have to have reviews on the child's plan that we talked about before. There will be meetings about the child's education and about their care plan, um, about health issues potentially with different professionals. And the foster care absolutely makes up that team of professionals because you're the person that's with that child 24 hours a day. So whilst there is huge advantages and most of the time it very much suits a flexible lifestyle, we still just need to know that people have got the capacity to be able to do all those, that, those bits of running around, those appointments for children and be available for their children. Um, I've jumped about here. I'm, see, I don't read off the slides. I just talk. <laughs> I've mentioned about transporting to school. Um, I'm financially stable. Now, this is another tricky one for us because you do get paid to be a foster carer and allowance. However, you do only get paid when you have a child in placement. And we have a very common situation where somebody will say, I really want to be a foster carer. I have a spare bedroom, I've got all of the above. Um, but let me give you a scenario, it's a, a couple. We both work to pay our mortgage, to pay our bills, to pay everything else, we both need to work. Um, I can work a bit flexibly, but not really. So they're in a bit of a catch 22 about, do I give up work to become a foster carer when there's no guarantee they're gonna get a placement straight away. There can sometimes be a little bit of a gap between placements so we do need people to be financially stable enough we don't have to have loads of money we don't have to be rich we don't have to be hugely well off but just financially stable enough to be able to say right if there was a month in between placements because we couldn't match the right child with you would you still be able to pay your bills we have that duty of care to make sure that you can still survive and live and pay your mm. bills um, so we do need a degree of financial stability just in case you ever have that break we try our best not to because we have hundreds and hundreds of referrals a week of children needing mm. fostering placements so it's not often but there are times where depending on people's own matching criteria say if you had your own children we may be saying that actually certain children aren't best placed with children if there was violence or sexualized behavior or something you may not want to match with people with birth children um, and in that case, it just could be that we say there aren't any matches for you this week because we need to make that match right for everybody. So there is a slight risk, and I don't want to put anybody off, that there's a gap in between placements. So that financial stability, that basic financial stability, just be able to pay you know, extra bills for a month or so is really important. Any questions? No? I'm taking that as good that people are understanding and enjoying what we're saying. So some of the practicalities, I think I've probably covered most of these as well. Um, but you provide, and, and I think Link can bring this to life. Link could probably give us a day in the life or a week in a life in a minute. But you're providing a stable home for a child. We've said that stability is a word we use all the time. Um, you're advocating for the child. We want them to be accessing education. We want them to have access to mental health services or medical services in the same way that you would as a parent. You're that, per that child's representative and that advocate. You, you, know, you know what they need and you're the person to fight for it. Um, mention this about contact, seeing birth family and so on. As hard as it sometimes is for foster carers because they know what might have happened at home, if it's deemed in the best interest for the child to see that their family then so be it that's part mm. of the role um, it's very important that young people's identity is maintained by foster carers so we do have cultural matches or we have non-cultural matches we could have um, a white christian child place with a muslim family but that muslim family will still work and let that white christian child know exactly where their roots are and you know if they mm. still want to go to church they can be supported in that and vice versa we have all sorts of matches going on um but and, and and that's fine it's more about just making sure that the child's identity is maintained and we can support foster carers with that as well we we have had foster carers who've said oh i just i'm just not sure how i'd how i how I'd, I'm, I'm a little bit naive to it i'm not sure how i how i look after a child from a different cultural background or a different faith but actually we've got people in the organization who have been there and done it and we support people, we give people reading, we put people in touch with other foster carers who have been in the same situation. We give guidance, we give support. There's always somebody to kind of support with that type of 
when somebody feels that it's kind of out of their comfort zone. Um, and ultimately, we all become adults, sadly. <laughs> I've got two six-year-old, nearly six-year-olds, and they keep saying, I want to be little forever. And I'm like, oh, I know. Um, but we want these children to be functioning members of society. We want them to go on and have an amazing life and be independent and know how to cook for themselves and know how to manage their money and know how to go into the workplace and make friends and have relationships and live a really fulfilled life. So ultimately that's the aim we are supporting these kids to become amazing adults which so many of them do Lynn gave me an example earlier the new mayor of Manchester is a care mm. experience lady so I haven't read the I've, I've sent it to myself but there's a perfect example of somebody who's been in care and what the foster care is that person must have had what difference they've made to her life and she is now the mayor of Manchester I mean that's incredible it's really cool um, yeah so Lynn do you want to talk about kind of a typical week a, a typical week. Oh, I can tell you about today. Why, why not? Up, then. So, so we get up at seven thirty. My husband gets himself ready while I sort my little one out, and then uh, my husband does the school run while I go. I've got a little gym in the house while I do my exercises for forty-five minutes, and then he comes home, and then we walk the dog. So we walk the dog for an hour. Then I went off and had some lunch with my friends. Then uh, came back and had supervision with my supervising social worker sorting out what training we needed, uh, how all our young people are doing. And then uh, my young person, my husband went off to bring my young person home and he was telling her all about his swimming certificate that he's got, he's on level three. He was telling her all about sports day. Uh, he did some reading to her. We, we, we were all clapping and cheering and he was just, just wonderful. Um, and, and then I've done a little bit of online training tonight. And then just got ready, cooked some dinner, and then got ready to talk to you tonight. So in one week, that there's not a huge amount of meetings. We have a we have um, a child looked after review once every six months. That's not a huge amount. We have a PEP meeting, which is basically a school meeting, a personal education planning meeting, which is like a parents' evening, but a really beefed up one. It's a one to one. We have that once a term. We have a, a child's medical, which is once a year. So, so these meetings aren't, aren't happening that often. You know, most of the time, I would say the vast majority of the time, our children are doing what they're supposed to do. They're getting up in the morning, they're going to school, they're yeah. coming home, they're doing the homework, they're having the tea, they're going to a club, they're going to bed, rinse and repeat. That's what they're doing. They are just children. I'll they're give you a really good example. I, I ran a choir for uh, some of our children. There was about 30 children. And we were in the head office and downstairs, there was a course, a skills to foster course, which when you initially want to be foster care, you go on. And there was maybe about 12 people on this course. And I went down and I said, we've got a choir upstairs. Can we, can we just come and sing to you? Cause we're going into a competition. I said, yeah, of course you can. So we came down and we sang and then the children were brilliant. And then they went upstairs. And people on this course said, so, so who were all those children? well there are looked after children but they were just like children singing yes yes they were just singing. there was no hell raisers there were no chairs being thrown there were no fires being lit they were just children singing in my choir and the vast majority of time that's what it is when it, when children are looked after it's never ever ever the child's fault ever 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 it's because something that's happened to them which is really sad mm. but most of the time they're doing what they're doing what children do and i and i love it i absolutely love being a foster i've done all sorts i've worked in a prison i've been in the police for 20 years i've taught that tap dancing i've taught singing but the thing that gives me the biggest joy and the biggest satisfaction is being a foster carer because it's like magic when you have a child that comes to you and they're maybe they're five and and they're still wearing nappies and they're non-verbal and they're, they're quite severely neglected because neglect is the main reason children come into care. And then within a couple of weeks, the change is amazing. It, it, it is like magic, the difference you can make to children. Mm. It, it is wonderful. And I'm absolutely passionate about being a foster carer. And I should be a foster carer till I'm 100. There is no doubt at all. There, there will be no retiring because it's not a job. It's a way of life that we choose to have. We've, we're going on holiday in a couple of weeks no no, no in the summer we're going on holiday uh, two weeks all-inclusive Lanzarote with a big water park in 
in April next year, we're off to Florida with the children for three weeks. And because of the generous fostering allowance, we, we, can, we can do all these extras. Mm -hmm. and, and it's fantastic and I love it. Marjorie. So on that point, so I'm curious to know, so all of these extras, are, is, are you expected to actually like fund all of that? So whatever it is that you get for an allowance that covers whatever lifestyle you want to provide for the child that you're fostering. It's, it's not like if you are going on holiday and then is, would there be an additional allowance so that you can bring the child on holiday or is it considered that the allowance that you have should cover all things? The, the allowance that you get is the allowance. It, it, that's it. So out of, out of your money, we're going to talk about finances later, but you would be expected to clothe the child. And, and there isn't like a set amount every month because you know what it's like at the beginning of a school term, then they need new uniform, they need new shoes, they need new trainers. Then the next month, they might not need any clothes. Or at the beginning of the summer holidays, you, you get their summer outfit, then in August, they might not need anything. So you get what the child needs. Um, and then you are expected to keep savings for the child, which is roughly a pound a day. Um, but apart from that, it, it's just the normal expenses that you would have as a child, a child living with you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there are some carers that that um, that that do go on camping holidays, and they and we do our fair share of that as well, and use hostels. And but sometimes we like to talk go on a really nice one with them mm -hmm. because we can. We'll come on to finances in a little while, Marjorie. Mm. Oops. Well, I think you can really just kind of look at Lynn for some of these as a typical, I mean, Lynn is a typical foster carer. Um, you need to have a sense of humour. You need to be resilient. You need to have compassion. We want people who are motivated in the right way um, to be able to do this. And we want people to work as part of a team. We see you as professionals because you are with that child all the time and you are able to feed back to other professionals like social workers therapists and so on exactly what you feel is right so if you feel you've got any of these kind of qualities which I guess a lot of people have that's it, it would put you in very good stead but again it's just about being a person a person who wants the best for a child that's ultimately where we're at with this we mentioned briefly before whole family fostering so if you're part of a couple you both need to be assessed if both, if you both live in the same home and you're both part of it one of you may be the main carer who does the bulk of the kind of the work for want of a better word but in the same way family any any families one person may be the main carer um other members of your family say if you've still got children at home or if you have somebody come and stay with you regularly or stepchildren or anything like that they will be involved in the assessment at points we want to know that one things they want to say about you and their kind of agreement to you fostering and that it's going to fit in with your lifestyle as a family. Um, but we support that. So Lynn's got birth children. A lot of our foster carers have got birth children and we support the whole family. We do events specifically for birth children. Birth children get to come to all the fun days and that type of thing. And they can meet other birth children of families who are fostering to kind of just chat to people and go, you know, we've got this child in our house and they've been here for a few months and it's great. And I've very rarely heard anything negative um, about the impact on the rest of the family. In fact, most people say it's been mm. the making of our family. It's made us more considerate. It's made us really just consider the wider world and what happens it's made us more accepting of people and that's the what that's not just the kids that's the wider family anyway um I remember and it's I, really it's really common law isn't it for uh people my sort of age to have children who have grown up with fostering to then become foster carers themselves really so it's common. very often that your children become foster carers and also siblings become fostering because once people know yeah. actually this is what it's like and these are the benefits for for you as a family they think yeah actually that would that would really yeah. work for me as well I just we sent your message Laura if you have a chance just to quick okay. check that we often get people who have said oh yeah my auntie used to foster or that that bit of inspiration has come through somebody knowing somebody who fostered or my um you know my parents did foster when I grew up fostering so yeah absolutely um oh I'm trying to move on and it won't let me let's have a look 
I think we've covered this. I didn't mention therapeutic. Now, therapeutic doesn't have an impact on the length of fostering, but one of the things that we are so proud about at Capstone, and I've worked for different agencies and Lynn's fostered for different agencies, but it, oh, you, can't, you can't talk passionately enough about it. We have an amazing therapeutic service, which in, in essence, and we can talk more about this, I'm very conscious of time, but this therapeutic service provides therapeutic support to foster carers, to enable foster carers to understand how to therapy, therapeutically parent the children in their care. But also what's unbelievably amazing is also that we have teams of clinicians from all sorts of type of therapy, drama therapy, art therapy, talking therapies that are appropriate for a child. We can do an assessment on a child. We can provide hand, you know, direct therapy to a child, which is actually like gold dust to access these services with the local authority and NHS CAM service, you're looking at, I mean, it's probably even longer now, but it, you're looking at at least a two year wait, whereas mm. actually foster carers can come to us and say, we really think we need an assessment on this child or young person. We've got it all there. We can put that mm. in and we're so proud and it, it helps everybody out. It helps the foster carer to have that support and the tools to be able to work with the child. It obviously helps the child if that's what the child needs. It means that there's that word again, more stability and um, placement is less likely to break down if all of those things in place and everybody felt feels halt held. Um, so we're really, really proud of that. And that really does kind of make us quite different from a lot of people. And mm -hmm. I mean, we talk for hours on it, but if anybody wanted another conversation about that, then they're more than ready. And staying put is something we mentioned briefly. That's um, basically where when a child turns 18, they don't have to be out on the streets and find their own way necessarily, just in the same way as most kids don't leave home at 18 anymore. You're not technically fostering anymore. It's a different scheme. But there's a small allowance for people to keep an 18 year old in their care and for, to help that transition into adulthood. I've mentioned this, how we work with local authorities. So I'll just briefly cover it. We receive. Laura, the I have a question, Laura. Yes. Hello. Yeah. yeah hi. Hi. I've been I've been with the children for past 30 years and I, it was my desire always to foster a child or one or two but you here I have noticed that the main criteria is you need to have a, a care room which I don't have so how do I solve the problem? Oh it, it's a perpetual problem for us I'm afraid. People ask why and people say well why can't I have a little one in my bedroom with me why can't I you know you know like some parents would but from a safeguarding point of view mm. the regulations tell us that we are not allowed to have a looked after child in the same bedroom as parents and the reason are you know you don't know if this child may have been abused you don't know if it's just not appropriate for them to be in that space um as kids get older they need their privacy mm. um okay. that you know they've got a lot going on so i'm i'm so sorry it's a very sad fact that Pe wonderful people like you who take the time to chat to us mm -hmm. without yeah, yeah. spare bedroom we can't progress mm -hmm. but I mean depending on your own situation I don't expect you to discuss this now but okay. uh, if if people there are times where you know depending if you if, if you receive housing allowance or that type of thing you could talk to your providers about your intent to fostering about your intent to foster or I mean I know somebody I, I was in a local cafe not long ago I spoke to her about fostering she said I know I want to foster. I have a son. It's me and my son. I don't have a spare room. I've only got two bedrooms. But it's my deter my my plan is that within the next so and so many years, I am going to get a three bedroom house so that I can foster. Mm. So if it's something you really want to do, I, again, it's not a problem we can just solve. Um, unfortunately, I wish we could because our lives would be so much mm. easier. We'd have so many more amazing carers. But it is genuinely a sticking point, you know, dictated by the breaks. I'm so sorry. The government doesn't help in any way. No, and this is a, this is another issue. I, I I mean, we could talk about this for a long time, and I am conscious of time. But no, there is no help in terms of okay. if, if, if okay. there is help, if there is a housing provider that you're linked to or anything like that, you can always have the conversation. But no, unfortunately, there's no specific allowance for foster carers, which is possibly something the government should be looking at. But mm. Who am I? <laughs> but thank okay. you for your question. It's a really yeah. valid question. It's, oh, a, yeah. it's a 
we have dozens of calls a day with people just like you who are really interested mm -hmm. But just I would, I would, because I've been a teacher for the past 30, 35 years. Amazing. And I, I love mm. kids, you know, I love mm -hmm. kids. Such a it, is, it is such a shame. I mean, keep in touch with us. Anybody on here, you know, like, like Lynn said at the beginning, we never hard sell. We're never going to over send you stuff. But if you send us your details afterwards or you could send them we've probably got them via Aideen and when you logged on to this we can always keep in touch with you over time and then oh, yeah. if the situation changes go on Aideen mm. no I was just going to say um is do you have anything on any of the slides about for anyone on the call who wants to follow up with you afterwards is there any information as to who they can contact initially or how to contact you actually yep I'll put mine and Lynn's details on here at the end so yeah mm. wonderful so I'll, I'll, I'll just rush over this because basic, the bottom line is we receive referrals from local authorities. We receive hundreds a day. We have a dedicated team who are absolutely brilliant. They read through these profiles of children and they, they get to know our foster carers and they're like, yeah, and we've got this young person. We think it could be perfect for you. We understand, you know, your experience, the dynamic of your home. This could be a really good match. And we have those conversations and then work with your social worker to make things happen. I think we've covered a lot of this. When you start, mm. nobody's a ready-made foster carer and we don't expect anybody to be a perfect foster carer because none of us are perfect humans, are we, anyway? Um, you get a thorough induction programme. You get family days, as we mentioned, so that your, your kids are involved, your birth children are involved if necessary. Um, Lynn mentioned about her supervision today. You get regular calls with your supervising social mm. work. You, you get to know them so well. They get to know you so well. And you can pick up the phone and ask them anything. One Another thing we're proud of is that we keep our social workers' caseloads really low. We did a review a couple of years ago. Um, local authority social workers, I mean, tragically, really, they can sometimes have caseloads of up to about 35 children. We have capped ours so that our social workers have the time to be able to dedicate to work with you because if they're spread too thin, no good to anyone. We have 24 hours support. You can phone up on Christmas night if you want. Somebody is always on the end of the mm. phone to support. You have mentors. So Lynn supports other foster carers in every single region. We put foster carers together to mentor and buddy up and support each other. Development, Lynn again mentioned, you have a training plan and you will, you will have access to so much training, some, some, some kind of core training that we, we have to do, but then so much other training that you can just say, yeah, I fancy that, that sounds really interesting, this would really help me with my young person, or actually I want to move into this type of fostering, so parent and child, I'd like to have some of that to help myself develop. The clinical support services, it's what I mentioned before in terms of therapy services, one of the services we're most proud of. And then we partner with an organisation called Foster Talk, who are kind of a bit of a specialist benefits organisation for foster carers. And they talk about those tax issues that I talked about. They can talk about, they give you legal support. They're an independent provider that we pay for that gives you access to all of this extra support, all these benefits. Um, I'm really proud as well that a lot of our managers, our registered managers, have a real open door policy. It's, there's no mm. hierarchy in Capstone. We're all doing a job together. We are all supporting foster carers and you can knock on the door literally <laughs> or pick up the mm. phone and have a chat to a manager at any time. And the dedicated placement officer I mentioned before, you'll get to know somebody who's picking up the phone to you and going, right, I'd like to talk to you about this young person who's just landed on my desk. Not literally, this piece of paper about a young person who has landed on my desk. And I'd like to talk to you about whether we could match that person with you. So you get all of this wraparound support all of the time. So if you are interested in going forward, and again, this is very high level information, but what would happen is you'd have a call with myself or one of my team to start with, where we would just explore your background. We'd ask you the questions about your spare room and your family setup, and um, whether you think you might be financially stable enough to consider this. But it's a very basic initial call for about 20, 30 minutes. And that's for you to grill us a little bit as well, if you wanted to. It's always two way. This whole thing is always two way. Um, and if we think, you know what? This person could be good and if you think yeah I'm going to take the next step we then arranged to come out and see you all through Covid we did it over a screen like this which has its benefits but we, we'd much prefer to come out and sit and have a cup of tea and gen, you know real good chat to you and find out a little bit more about your past and your motivation to foster and just 
a couple of hours of discussion about you and why you want to foster and whether we think you're appropriate to foster. And again, you've got time to ask us questions. Um, we then get you to complete an application form if you still think you want to go forward and we think you're going to be good. And then Lynn mentioned before, we have skills to foster training, which is a couple of days training course, which gives you the basics of what fostering is about. We then go into the assessment and in the assessment, we do what's called our stage one checks. They're the statutory checks and they're the factual checks. So things like the DBS, which is a criminal record check, things like references, your medical. Um, uh, we do a local authority check to check that you're not already known to social services, that you haven't had your children removed from your care, things like that, just kind of the, the referencing type side of things. And then we do visits where a social worker is allocated to you. And we expand upon that initial home visit in about eight sessions. Somebody will come and sit with you, explore different areas of your life, explore your childhood, explore your resilience, explore your relationships. Some people think it's quite intrusive, but most people say, I totally understand why this has to be done, because we have to be so careful that people are coming into fostering for the right reasons. If there's anybody out there who had intentions that we wouldn't want them to have around looking after children in their own home we'll be able to wheedle that out so it you know we've seen all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds with all sorts of complex lives and it doesn't necessarily stop them from fostering so we always say we've probably seen it before you know mm. if, if, if we can if we can verify everything and if there's nothing majorly untoward with you as a person and a family chances are all will be fine and then there's training and you go to panel at the very end. And that sounds very scary, but it's not because by the time you've been through all this with your social worker, you'll know yourself better than you knew yourself before. Um, your social worker will go know you and you sit in front of a group of people who will have read the document, which is called a Form F, all about you. And they'll probably ask a few questions about you, but you'll be so prepared. And then chances are you'll be approved at that point. What we try to do is say that actually, if, if there was any stages before the panel where we thought things weren't gonna go forward, we'd have a chat to you. We wouldn't put you through the pain of panel if we thought mm. that there was something that wasn't going to go anywhere. Um, and you'll be handheld by somebody in my team for the whole of this. You'll have a, a person that you'll get to know and they'll be there helping you, giving you hints and tips, coordinating things for you. Same as once you become a foster carer, you're really looked after all through this. Laura, it's worth saying that any time in that process, you can say, do you know what? Oh, this isn't for me. So always once, the whole if, thing once, you, once you start the process of finding out any time, any time you can back out and say, no, now I know a little bit more. It, and, yeah. that, and that's it. You won't be Absolutely. hounded. You won't be persuaded. <laughs> It's your life and we are grateful to be having the conversations. You know, life happens to people as well. We have people yeah. with assessment who just say, I've, I've had a bereavement. I, I just can't do this anymore. And we say, okay, please yeah. come back to us in the future, yeah. but go and look after yourself or, you know, a health issue came up that they weren't aware of. Any Life yeah. happens and people do change their mind. People do discover something and think, actually, this might not be for me. So it's always two way, this whole process. Marjorie, <laughs> Marjorie has a question. Yeah, I do actually. So just as far as the process, do you have like an average length of time that it takes from start to finish? Yeah, um, probably between four and six months. Okay, super. Yeah, six months at the most. We try and, and kind of keep the momentum going and keep get try and get you to panel within four months. Um, but again, actually, it's a lot down to the applicant, to the person who's, who is the prospective foster carer, because if you can make yourself available and you can be part, you know, throw yourself into that assessment, there's no reason why that can't, you know, be met in that um, three to four months. Sometimes it's things like the DBS and the references that actually delay things and we mm. can't do anything about that. But yeah, absolute average four to six months. But we, okay, we, try, and, we, try, we try and go faster. Sorry, Marjorie. No, 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 that was that was great. But thank you. OK. Um, so we've talked about finances and if anybody wanted any more detailed information, they can contact me. I've got the details at the end. But roughly. You get paid between 360 and it's probably higher than that now. It's probably more like 380 and 650 pounds per week, depending on the child. So as a very rough illustration, if you had one child, 
who was in the younger bracket, kind of five years old, without huge, huge needs, you'd be at that lower end. If you had a teenager who was accessing therapeutic services, this is just to illustrate the point. There's obviously every single type of scenario in between. If you had a teenager who was accessing therapeutic services, you'd be looking more at the late 500, 600 pound mark. So this is that these fees are worked out based upon the kind of inputs you'll have and like the extra attendance at therapy sessions and that type of thing. And then just, and that's per just, child per, per week. Child. So per child per week. So yeah, if you sorry. have three children, then Having on three average, kids. it would probably be 1,500 per week, basically tax free. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so just to illustrate, because people are so used to hearing about salaries, not that it is a salary, but we use this to illustrate the point. If you look after a child in a therapeutic placement, you'd be getting £26,000. And you see that the threshold for tax is so much higher than a, a job. Um, mm. But all of the tax stuff, obviously tax is such a personal thing with implications in terms of what other things you have going on. But we have access to people who can support you in all of that as well. I'm no tax expert, so don't ever ask me. <laughs> but we, you know, we'd be able to guide you and we'd be able to talk you through. But those pay rates you know, are fairly across the board. So, no question is a silly question. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to ask us? I will go on to the next slide because here's our contact details if anybody wanted to jot anything down. Myself and Lynn are at the bottom. I don't know why mine's not blue and underlined, but that's just... But if you phone that 0800 number, it's not like a big call centre or something. There's a couple of my team who sit there and answer that call. It looks a bit more, bit more official than it is. We've just got a lovely few... Um, ladies on the team just happen to be ladies same with the that hello email address you'd get through to one of my team um and if you mention my name things can always get back to me but my email address is here and lynn has very kindly said that if anybody had a question for her about what it's really like being a foster carer then you can have added of course i'd be really happy to have a telephone conversation with anybody if you want to talk at a one-to-one -one. um i'd be really happy to do that yeah. I, I can't i can't share enough enthusiasm about the role i absolutely love being a foster carer and the difference that we can make yeah absolutely may i ask a question actually just okay. be quiet but i i do have a question i just wondered um if there are siblings in need of foster care is there is an effort made for the siblings to be fostered together yes we would always, 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 always try and place siblings together. Always. Yeah. There are occasions where it's not right for siblings to be placed together because there could be a dynamic in that relationship that one, you know, again, worst case scenario, but to illustrate a point, one actually could be involved in the abuse, for instance. Right. Yeah. Um, but in most circumstances, is always I mean there, there was a BBC documentary not long ago which I could send to people if they were interested um about uh, actually John Batiste and he was exploring he was separated from his siblings as a child and mm -hmm. he was exploring the impact that had on him and has on other children so the absolute aim where it's appropriate is to keep siblings together because that's the one constant that those children have had isn't it mm -hmm. throughout their lives um the sad fact is that it's hard to keep siblings together because people need space, people need um, the time and all that type of stuff. Mm. So it is tricky. It's something I'm personally really passionate about it. A lot of us in Capstone, of course, mm. are very passionate about it. And wherever possible, we try and keep siblings together. Sometimes yes. practicalities of room, room sizes and that thing can be, a, sadly, a real challenge. But the aim is to keep them together. Mm. Can't and sometimes, sometimes, of course, we're talking huge groups of siblings. Yeah. You know, sometimes we're talking seven, eight, nine siblings. And right. it would be unrealistic for one yeah. foster carer to do that. So in the case of maybe nine siblings, you might be looking at three or four carers all living geographically together that they might be able to uh, keep because to, to keep contact it would be really important yeah we've worked on that before where we've said right well we've got these three carers down the road let's and that's mm. i mean that's just wonderful when you can make that happen and yeah. know that they're all actually whilst they're not in the same house they're, they're part of that network together yeah amazing thank you thank you it's a pleasure very very thank much are, are there any more questions 
No, if that's it, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Laura and Lynn and to Capstone. Um, it was just an amazing session, really interesting. Um, and Lynn, thank you for your incredible enthusiasm about Foster You're Villa. welcome. Um, You're it's welcome. completely infectious, so really appreciate that. Um, and thanks, Laura, for all the information that you've provided. And a huge thank you to... The Restless members who've joined us this evening yes, thank you. Um, really appreciate the questions you've asked um, and your input on this as well. So really delighted that you've joined us now. We have run over time, so apologies for that, but it was incredibly interesting and there was a huge amount of information to impart. So I hope you didn't mind that too much. Um, so all there is to say is thank you. Enjoy the rest of your thank evening. You. When I close the call it closes for everyone i'm afraid that's, that's okay. the nature so just good night and thanks so much for joining us this evening thank you everybody lovely to lovely to have you all on here